Good to see each one here back with us tonight, and it's uh, been a beautiful day, it has, and uh, we, uh, looks like we're going to have a, a week ahead of us with a lot of warm weather, everyone be careful, and while you're out working, and uh, especially me, I'm the worst about getting out and getting too hot and things happening, but we want to uh, give the Lord all the praise and glory and honor. I love that song, that last song you just sang, open our eyes, Lord, open our ears, Lord. The Bible talks about that. It talks about opening our understanding. And I love it. I've done actually a message on those openings that God talks about in the Scripture. Tonight I want to, uh, once again, kind of do a teaching, preaching message for you on Sunday nights, kind of low-key a little bit if that's possible. But tonight if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 5. The book of Mark chapter 5. Um. You know, uh, often, oftentimes we, we find ourselves not understanding things. We find ourselves not understanding what we're not seeing. And right now in the days that we're living in, it's hard to understand why we go through what we do. And a lot of times I find that people are afraid of the future. I'm hearing this a lot nowadays, you know, what's our future going to be? You know, what's it going to be like, you know, another Three or four years from now, things keep going the way they are. And uh, so tonight, I want to kind of help you through that. I love trying to help us transition our thoughts, our actions, our faith in God as we go through times like this. Because, you know, from the beginning of time, and even in the days of Noah, it was like that then. I mean, just think about what Noah went through. You know, he hammered on an ark all day long, and he hammered on the Word of God all night long, trying to get people to understand that uh, something's going to happen. Things are changing, and people needed to have faith and trust God and, and listen to what was taking place. So it was an unseen, something that had never happened before. We have a lot of unseen things that go on in the world. And, uh, you know, I think about how people are afraid of the future of America. I'm not afraid of the future of America. God created this world. The Bible says he owns it and cattle on a thousand hills. So what am I to fear as a Christian is where I'm coming from tonight. What are we afraid of? I'm going to go to one verse of Scripture. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Let's say that again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's it. That's a key element here. So we're going we're gonna to go to the book of Mark here in a few minutes. I'm going to read some out of there before we do. But I want you to understand that there's so many different great stories, illustrations about the unseen and how people responded to what they did not see and did not know with faith. It comes times sometimes in our lives that we just don't have the answer. You ever felt like that? I just, I've had people come to me for counseling for different reasons, for spiritual counseling as well as 
marriage counseling, and sometimes I just tell them, I don't have the answer, but I know who does. I know who does. So I kind of set Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John down in the middle of it, and I take off from there. So tonight, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I want you to ask yourself a question. What is it that I'm struggling with that I don't understand? Lord, help me to understand it. Is that a good prayer? I think it is. Fathers, we bow our heads tonight. We, we have so many things in our world right now we don't understand. But I'm just going to trust you, dear Lord, with all of it because from the beginning of time, Lord, you had a plan. And nothing I can do or anyone else will thwart that plan, dear Father. It's your plan. And I pray right now tonight, dear Lord, that you'll help all of us in this sanctuary tonight. Leave this place, Lord, looking for you to work. And I say this so many times, Lord, it's time for you to work. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I'm asking, dear God, that you show us, Lord, your presence. You, you help us to feel your presence like you did this morning as well as tonight, dear Lord, as we go into the Scripture and we gain so much energy, so much information, and so much hope from what you have given us in front of us every day called your Word. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, I asked my wife before we got here tonight, I said, honey, is it okay if I use you as an illustration tonight? She said, sure, what is it? <laughs> you know, that's going to be the next question. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to be talking a little bit about blindness tonight. And you know, uh, going through what we've gone through with Christy losing her vision has been an unseen thing. And for her, I can tell you, for her, uh, it's the unseen that she's had to deal with now for a lot of years as she continually started losing her vision with RP. And for me as a husband, as a husband, I didn't know what the future was going to hold for us in the ministry, the mission field. We're missionaries. We've been on the mission field a long time. And, and to, to be able to go through that, and we had nowhere to go for help. Nobody can really help her. There's a lot of scientific stuff going on, but that unseen for her every day as things would change, and for me too, was very hard. Very hard. It's kind of like Blind Man's Bluff. Did you ever play that when you were a child? And, and, and then I, I remember a couple of times that in one of our church events, we, we, I used to work with a Spanish church in Reno, Nevada when I was pastoring First Southern Baptist Church in Reno, and we'd started a, a mission one of the first Spanish missions, actually, there in Reno. And uh, every time we'd get together in the fellowship, they'd bring in the piñatas. You know what a piñata is? You get this big, long stick, and they love to tie a cloth around the preacher's head and make him look stupid, you know, because I'm out there swinging at this thing right and left, never, never hitting it. And, and it's the unseen that's so hard. Can't make contact. Very hard to make contact with the unseen. God understands that in our lives, how hard it is. And uh, we often take these timid steps, even as grown-ups. We don't like the dark. I don't know about you. You know, sometimes we'll find ourselves stumbling around in the dark at night, going to get a drink of water, or doing this or something. You know, we often take these timid steps because we don't want to fall. We have reasons to be cautious because we are blind. We're all blind to the future. Do you agree with that? Say amen. We're all blind to the future. We can't see the future. And we have absolutely no vision beyond the present. Now we can say, well, you know, the Bible says people without a vision will do what? They'll perish. But in reality, I can have all the faith I want to have, but I can't really see it. I want that vision in my heart and my mind. Every church should have a vision. Every pastor should have a vision for his ministry. And a lot of my visions, they came to a reality at times. But in reality, I didn't know what that was going to mean sometimes, you know, because I didn't have it. I can't tell you with certainty that I will live even long enough to finish this statement. Whew, I just did. I just did. And I can't nor can I tell you, will you live long enough to hear the rest of my sermon? But I hope you do. 
I hope you do. This is the way it is. And so we, we struggle with this. And, and I'm not talking nearsightedness. And I'm not talking about a obstruction of view. I'm talking about blindness. How do we deal with what we can't see? Seeing the unseen. I'm describing a condition that passes only with death, if you really think about it. We are blind to the future. It's one of those limitations that we all share. And it's amazing because it affects every person. The wealthy are just as blind to the future as the poor is. Just because you have money don't mean you, you know the future. You think everybody knows, well, he knows the future. He's got it all taken care of. No, you don't. You really don't. None of us know how our children will even turn out, do we? How many have been surprised? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> That's all right, because you did. I could raise mine too. None of us know the day we'll die. Now, I'm just giving you some things here. Really, this is real. I'm a pastor of reality. You probably noticed that. And I'll bring that reality out to our lives to help us to understand the reason why faith is so important to us. Some people don't know who they're going to marry, do they? I didn't know I was going to marry Christy for a long time in my life. I didn't know the future. Didn't know it. And so as I try to weigh in on this and really show you a few things about the importance of this, I'm going to take you into the book of Mark now. And we're going to read some scripture. And I'm going to enter a man named Jarius into this story. It's a great story, but it's one we need to recognize because when I, when I started reading this passage of Scripture, I went back to chapter 5, the beginning of it. I even went back to uh, the end of chapter 4. And I, I'll always like to read the, the back side of the Scripture I'm going to preach on as well as the front side of it. And kind of bring it into the, the story the way that it's unfolding. And I find here that Jesus is getting in and out of a ship. And it seems like every time he steps out of the ship, he's seeing the unseen again. He's dealing with some kind of problem. And uh, we find out there in uh, the beginning of chapter 5, he came out of the ship, the Bible says in verse 2, and immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. We never know from one day to the next what we're going to meet up with. Neither did Jesus. But Jesus, of course, he's all-knowing. He's ready, he's prepared, but not you and I. That's an unseen for us. Would you be been shocked if you stepped out of the boat and there was an unclean spirit standing there waiting for you? I believe I would be a little bit shocked along the way. And then Jesus, of course, we know that he delivered him out of that. Totally out of it. Then we come to verse 21, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship and to the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name and when he saw him he fell at his feet and he besought him greatly saying my little daughter lieth at the point of death I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live and Jesus went with him and much people followed him and they thronged him now that, that word thronged there is an interesting word because it, it, it means that this crowd of people is so large and so big that they're pushing against him and actually causing him to, to move in maybe in a direction he didn't want to go. And that's what they wanted to happen, and no doubt, and these things are, are beginning to happen here. But then we see again in this same chapter another unseen thing is fixing to take place. Right in the middle of one problem he's being asked to solve, he gets another problem dumped in his lap. You ever felt that way? Whoa, how much more can I handle? And the Bible says, In a certain woman which had an issue of blood, 12 years, had suffered many things and many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind, so there, there it is again, that throng is, is pressing, everybody's pressing and moving. It touched his garment. 
Now, many times, it, and it's, it's known, and you'll see this in our Ray Vanderlyn studies, that they wear a lot of robes with tassels around the bottom of it. Do you realize a high priest wore a robe? And he would have a golden bell and a pomegranate at the bottom of his robe. Now, here's the interesting thing. People miss this a lot of times, but it's true. That the high priest, every time he'd go into the temple in the Holy of Holies to pray, they made sure that they, hear, they could hear the bells. They put the pomegranates in between the bells of the bottom of the robe, and it would make the right sound. And it's been said that they would tie a rope on him. And if he went inside there and them bells wasn't ringing, they'd drag him out by the rope. So that garment is very important because the tassels that hang from that garment is usually what they try to get a hold of. And this is kind of the picture I'm giving you. She's, like everybody else, trying to just get a hold of something that Jesus has. And it's amazing because he said, and I shall be whole. And, and he said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press. He's still being pressed, but turned him about and said, Who touched my clothes? You know, amazing thing about that, that verse there that really is precious is no matter how busy Jesus is, no matter what he's got to take care of, he knows our needs. He knows us. He knows us. He knew her. He felt faith. You get that? How do we feel faith from someone? Jesus felt her faith. That's amazing to me. A lot of people will read through that and will miss it. But he was feeling her faith more than anything else from her. Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest this multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of the plague. None of these others got healed. She got healed because of her faith and what she did. She, should have, she could have easily given up on the odds of him even knowing her that she'd, he'd even been touched by her. She could have given up on the odds. Not knowing, unseen, didn't know. There's healing in spite of the program. You know, today it's amazing to me. We go to uh, doctors and we, have, we pay a lot of money for insurance. I don't know about you, but I paid a lot of money for insurance. And it's amazing because they always want you in the program. If you're not in my program, you're not going to pay. We're not going to pay for it. <laughs> I'll be in God's program. Thank you. She wasn't in the program. In fact, there were some hypocrites there trying to keep her probably away from him saying he ain't got time for this, don't be fooling with him, leave him alone. She wasn't in the program. Sometimes we wonder where we are in the program. Healing in spite of the program is what I like. When God steps in in spite of what my insurance company says or what anybody else says, God brings healing in my life despite all the program. She was outside the program of what normally happens. Even at times the apostles were disciplined by Jesus. He said, forsake not the little ones that come unto me as such. It should be as a millstone hung around your neck if you do. Be careful how we take care of these little ones. We know sometimes these little ones don't seem to be in the program, or at least we think they're not. VBS proves that different, doesn't it? I want to say this with all the faith I have in God. Humanity's not going to heal you. They're going to treat you. They're not going to heal you. Do I need to say that again? I don't think so. I think you got it. 
Humanity is not going to heal you. They're going to treat you. All healing, I personally believe, you believe what you want to. I believe all healing comes through God, and I believe God to use nurses, He uses doctors, He uses medicine, He uses research, He uses all of that sometimes in His healing process. But the healing comes through God. The treatment comes through all the professionals, which are very important because God uses who? People. God uses people. I've often said, me and Jesus, that's a crowd I need. Is me and Jesus. Jesus paid. Here you go. You ready? Jesus paid for all my healing. He paid for all of your healing. You want to hang on to that, folks. Don't ever try to separate that. Doctors can treat you, but only God can heal you. Doctors can help your pain, and they can ease the pain. But we need to press in, touch Jesus, and pray in faith, believing that God can heal and God still does heal. I've seen people heal before my eyes before. You you only have to be on a mission field for a little while in a foreign country to see the power of God. Here we don't see Jairus as a nicely groomed civic leader. He instead is a blind man begging for a gift from God. He fell at the feet of Jesus saying again and again, My daughter is dying. Now we're going to read what's taking place next. Because there's a separation in the dialogue here that's happening in this story. It's a, it, it's a transition that's a little different in Scripture. Verse 35, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? She's no longer in his program. Hello? She's no longer in his program. What's wrong with these disciples? What's wrong with these people? Don't they believe that Jesus can work beyond their program? As soon as Jesus heard, now watch, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only what? I like that. Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. He seeth the turmoil and them that wept and wailed greatly. Oh, she's gone. She's gone. There's no hope. Hope's all lost. It's gone. She's no longer in his program, no longer in this world. And when he had come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother and the damsel and them that were with him, entered in where the damsel was lying. He took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talithea Kumar. That's Aramaic, by the way. And it means, little maid, arise. The scripture says, damsel, I say unto you, arise. But it actually in Aramaic, it means little maid, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and she walked. For she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. And commanded that something should be given to her to eat. She's well. She's going to have a meal. She's going to get her strength back. And she's walking. She's not in the program of man. She's in God's program. God supplies. A big man begging for a gift from God. My daughter's life. He, and here's what I notice about this scripture. And I want to get into it a little, little deeper here. He doesn't barter with Jesus. 
You do me a favor and I'll see that you're taken care of for the rest of your life, Lord. He doesn't negotiate with Jesus. He's a man of power and authority. The guys in Jerusalem are getting pretty testy about your annex. He doesn't make any excuses. Normally, I'm not this desperate, Jesus. But Jesus, I've got a small problem. He really wasn't a small problem. It was a big problem. It was a big problem. But what he does now, here's where we are. When we don't see the unseen and we don't know what the future holds, all we've got left to do is have faith and plead with Jesus. Just plead. There are times in life when everything you have to offer is nothing compared to what you're asking to receive. This is where Jairus was. What could a man offer in exchange of a child's life anyway? What could he offer? So there were no games, no haggling, no masquerading around. This man is serious. He knows the only hope he's got, it's not in his position, it's not in his power, it's not in his money, it's not in his friends, it's not even in his religion. It's in Jesus. There are times when everything we have to offer is nothing compared to what we're asking. And God who knows what it's like to lose a child. Now, are you with me on this one? Empowers his son. His only begotten son. That he's going to lose on the cross. To bring life to another dying soul. It's the most awesome story you could read just about in the scripture. And nothing hurts like losing a child. When my sister was killed in a plane crash. And I remember my father died shortly after that. Because he never got over her death. My mother said to me, and I'll never forget it. I said, Mom, how are we going to get through this? It's so hard. I said, Dad's gone and Brenda's gone. And, and I said, it's just you and me now. And she said, Son, she said, I know it's hard you losing your dad, but there's nothing any worse than losing your sister. Your dad couldn't overcome it. He couldn't. He had a lot of health issues. But before Jesus and Jairus get very far, they're interrupted by emissaries from his house. And this is what we are challenged with every day, the unfaithful. Your daughter's dead. There's no need to bother the teacher anymore. Get ready, folks. This is when God's going to step in and say, watch. Hang on to your hat for a moment. Here's where the story gets moving. Jesus goes from being led to leading, from being convinced by Jairus to convincing Jairus, from being admired to being laughed at, from helping out the people to casting out the people. That's what Jesus does. He takes total control. Here's where Jesus takes control. Jesus paid no attention to what they said, and I, and I love that line when he said, be not afraid, only believe. What was he trying to teach and get across to the crowd that was pressing? It described the critical principle of seeing the unseen. Ignore what people say, block it out, turn them off, close your ears, and you have sometimes to walk away from those that don't have faith in God and don't believe that there's no problem so great that God cannot solve. No problem so great that God cannot solve in your life and in my life. We need to trust Him to solve it the way He, he solved it. Ignore the ones who say it's too late to start over with your life. It's never too late to start over with your life. Disregard those who say you'll never amount to anything. My goodness, look at the Apostle Paul. He was a terrorist. Paul was a terrorist, went around terrorizing the church and Christians, having Stephen stoned to death. He'll never amount to anything. He can't start over. He wrote more books in the New Testament than anyone else did. 
Faith sometimes begins by stuffing our ears with cotton and saying to the world, I don't want to hear this garbage. I'm going to believe in Jesus. The rest of the world can believe in the money trail. The rest of the world can believe in military power. Military power can't do anything with anything's dead and trespasses and sin. They don't have enough power. They have the power to fight battles, and I thank God for them. Faith sometimes begins by stuffing our ears. Jesus turns immediately to Jairus and pleads, Don't be afraid, Jairus. He says, Don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus compels Jairus to see the unseen. I think he's saying, Don't limit yourself with the possibilities to the visible. Don't be controlled by, by logic even. Believe that there's more to life than, than meets the eye. Oftentimes I had to give Christy encouragement. And you will when anyone leaves in their vision. And I keep reminding her as she lost more and more of her vision, everything's still the same, sweetie. I'm still here. I'm still as handsome as ever. How long has it been since you saw my face? Two years? God help you when you do. You know. Giving her that encouragement to see the unseen. An example of faith was found on the, on the wall once of a concentration camp. And the prisoner had, had carved it out. He said, I believe in the sun even though it doesn't shine. I believe in love even though it isn't shown. I believe in God even though he doesn't speak. Sometimes we're not going to hear God. Sometimes we're not going to see God. Sometimes we need faith in God that he's still there. God's all-knowing. He's all-seeing. All he's omnipresent. He's always there with us. I try to imagine the person who, who etched these words in the eyes that, that chose to see the unseen. Paul wrote in, first, second, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, While we look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Glory, hallelujah. That'll make a Baptist shout. Jesus is asking Jairus to see the unseen, to make a choice, either to live by the facts or to see by faith. Let me say it again. Either to live by the facts or to see by faith. When tragedy strikes, and too often it does, it takes a hard left sometimes, and we don't know what to do. We can see either the hurt that we're going through, we can see either the loss we're going through, or we can see the healer. Which one is it? I thank God that Christy and I have chose to see the healer, whether in this world or without this world. Jairus made his choice. He made his choice. You know, people, when they, I love the scripture, you know, Mary and Martha, the brother Lazarus. And Lazarus has been buried four days in the tomb. And they got mad at Jesus. Jesus, where were you? He was your friend. If you'd been here, he, would, he wouldn't have died. He's been in the tomb four days now and he stinks. And Jesus goes to the tomb and he goes, Lazarus, get up from there. And Lazarus comes out with the grave clothes on. You know what Jesus did? He called him away from the grave clothes and put on the grace clothes. Whew. Come out of there, Lazarus, and put on the grace clothes. Take off them grave clothes. It's by the grace of God that any of us are here even right now. Right now. Jesus is asking Jairus to see the unseen. Make a choice. Either live by the facts and by faith. And tragedy's going to strike. It does for all of us. We opt for the faith of Jesus. And Jesus saw that Jairus is going to opt with faith for him. And Jesus saves his daughter. Verse 39, at home, in the house. 
God's point of view is death is not permanent. Why do you think, as I close tonight, why do you think that Jesus was put on a cross and died? Yeah, he died for our sins. But God's already showing us something, that, that he has power over the death and the grave. He needed to resurrect Jesus for you to understand there's no problem so great he cannot solve. Our greatest enemy, according to Thessalonians, is the grave and death. But we've overcome it, it says. We've overcome the death and the grave with our faith in Jesus Christ. You're going to live throughout all eternity with a new body. From God's perspective, death is a small price to pay. Now I want you to get this tonight. I want you to leave here with this in your mind. Death is a small price to pay for the privilege of sitting at his table. You get that? Now my mother used to say to me, son, you go in there and you wash your hands and you clean your face before you come to this table. Did your mom ever tell you that, Lou? You clean yourself up, son, before you come to this table. And washing my hands and doing that was a small price to pay for being able to sit down to a good meal. Flesh and blood, the Bible says, can't have a part in the kingdom of God. God is even more insistent than my mama was. In order to sit at his table, a change of clothing must occur. Hang on now. We must die in order for our body to be exchanged for a new one. Glory, hallelujah. Whew. God's viewpoint of death is not to be dreaded. It's to be welcomed. To be welcomed. When he sees people crying and mourning over death, he wants you to know, why are you crying? When we see death, we see disaster. When Jesus sees death, he sees deliverance. That's too much for most people to take. They laughed at him in verse 40. Now, here's my conclusion. I promise you, I'm going to close. God is not going to let the noise distract you from your journey. He's still busy casting out the critics, silencing the voices that will deter. Some of God's works you don't see. Only when you get home will you know how many times He's protected you. Mark it down. God knows you and I are blind. He knows living by faith and not by sight doesn't come naturally. And I think that's one reason that he put this story in the Bible and he raised Jairus' daughter. Isn't that awesome? What a lesson in life for us to learn. I challenge you tonight. Go out of here tonight living in faith. Yes, the unseen is hard. Yes, the unseen sometimes makes us wonder where the Lord is. But I like what 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. And the Bible says in the voice of an archangel is going to call one day, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. I don't know what day or when that's going to happen. I may be in the grave when it happens. It does. I'm going to go on up anyway. But it might be him coming back and he's calling. I hear that trump sound and I'm going to go in the rapture. Maybe it'll be with you. Who knows? It's getting closer every day. But leave here tonight and face tomorrow with faith that Jesus, he's got this. He's got this. Fathers, we bow our heads tonight. We are so thankful that you've got this.
because we don't. Lord, I don't even want to try to say that I know the future. I don't. I only know that you hold it in your hands. And Lord, I'm going to trust you with my future because that's the only thing I know now that works. I pray for each one that's here tonight, dear God, and the day that you've given us has been precious. Study your word. See you work in the hearts of people's lives. In the life here of this church, dear Lord, it's a precious church. Been here many years, dear Lord, and I pray that will be here many more and people will be growing in their faith and coming to know you because of the work that's been done. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.